Hey folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiatoria and Lucy Easton. So we're here with um, my dirty weapon again, which we did. Um, I, I was very happy with how the blade came out. How did you? Yeah, it was really good actually. It, it, it looked like it was going to require a lot more work than it actually did. Basically it was old oil and uh, we wiped it off. Yeah, so uh, we used primarily, well we started with kind of um, just oil and a rag, then we upgraded to Brasso, and then we ended up moving up to Autosol with a, with a cloth, and Autosol is good stuff. Um, and uh, as you can see, the blade has come up absolutely beautifully, um, both sides. So what we're gonna look at now are the other bits of the sword which have been affected. So as mentioned before, the blade has been protected by the scabbard, okay? So the scabbard has taken one for the team, essentially, and this is often the case with antique swords, that often the scabbard um, is the thing which will be in the worst condition. Um, and do you know what? If anything's gonna be in bad condition on a sword, I suppose the scabbard is the least important, isn't it? The scabbard is just a container for the blade. Absolutely, although some people do get very sort of emotionally involved in the idea of whether it has a scabbard, but, but yeah, the, the sword's more valuable. Yeah, so when I started collecting many, many moons ago, when I was uh, <clears throat> just a young, just a young man. Many, uh, many moons many, ago. Many, many moons ago. Um, I, I was always told, oh, you know, always buy swords with a scabbard. Um, and I, I, you know, for my part, I'd say that bollocks pretty much. Buy, buy a good sword, okay? A scabbard is just a scabbard. And yes, having a scabbard adds value to a sword. No question whatsoever. Um, it adds a percentage to, to its total value. Uh, and I can't give you a fixed percentage because it depends on the sword. But some of the swords in my collection are uh, extremely unusual, extremely desirable, and some of them don't have scabbards. And do I care about that? No, not really, no. Um, you know, the sword, the sword is the main thing. And if you've got a sword that is uh, unusual or in great condition or, um, you know, belong to someone famous, then clearly those are the most important things. Whether it's got a scabbard or not is secondary. Um, and it's, it's even less than cosmetic, I would say. It's incidental. Uh, and in some cases, so I get asked a lot actually by people who are collecting, they say, oh, I've got this really nice sword, Matt, I need a scabbard for it. And unfortunately, I have to tell you, um, all of these swords were made to go with a scabbard. So people like me who co have collected for a long period of time, sometimes we come across spare or loose scabbards. And yes, sometimes we keep those. And when we get a sword which doesn't have a scabbard, we see if our sword which doesn't have a scabbard fits one of the scabbards. And it's rare that they do, even though these are patterns and they follow standard models and standard designs, they have very slightly different width at different portions along the blade, very slightly different thickness, slightly different curvature, slightly different length. And fundamentally, you know, if you take, for example, well, this, an 1821 pattern, like cavalry officer's sword, pipe back, you'd think, oh, well, you know, surely the same type of scabbard for any one of these will fit all the others. No, not at all. Unfortunately, so unless you just collect lots and lots of scabbards and occasionally you find one that fits, it's not something that I can do for anyone is to just go, oh, here you go, I'll sell you a scabbard, that will fit your sword, because it probably won't. You literally need to try every sword with every scabbard to find one that fits. Right, so let's get on to the actual cleaning. So cleaning the scabbard, I'm gonna possibly in this video, we'll see how the timing goes, um, but we're gonna look at cleaning the hilt as well at some point. But for now, I'm gonna put the sword to one side. I'll leave it there so you've got something nice to look at and something, something for the camera to focus on. Um, <laughs> That's really as, funny because it just went in as, the, as I see the focus goes. <laughs> I do not know why this camera doesn't like this setup. I don't know whether it's the lighting or the angle or whatever. I think it's too dark in here. It could be that we just don't have enough lighting in here. But um, anyway, I apologise if it's difficult to see. But hopefully the instructions, uh, there goes the focus again. Come on. There we go. But right, let's keep, keep moving around here. Um, if, um, yeah, if the focus and the quality, the, uh, either the audio or the visual quality is not the best, I apologise for that, but hopefully what we show and what we explain will be enough to be useful to some people. Um, and you'll notice that we have removed the towels 
towels which the, I the never knew. The offending towels. Yeah, apparently it must be a real bitch if you what you really want to do is reviews of towels. If you want to have a towel reviewing channel, I don't know what you do. Do you think there are towel reviewing channels? There must be towel reviewing channels, but I'm not going to look for them. Who um, <laughs> uh, would? I'm not that old yet. Um, although we do need some new tea towels now. Because uh, we keep using them for cleaning tools. Um, so, uh, yeah, so cleaning a scabbard. So first of all, scabbards, as I mentioned, are the things which are often the most rusty, uh, fundamentally, but they're also, in a sense, the easiest thing to clean because they are plain iron, there's no etching, there's usually no decoration. Uh, there's sometimes etching. <coughs> There's very rarely anything on a scabbard at all. Name one sword which has etching on the scabbard. You were saying to that guy the other day that some of them have etching on the top. No, that's then... engraving. Oh, okay. Yeah, I wasn't so, paying so attention, difference, apparently. So, difference between engraving and etching. So, etching is done with acid and is burned into the surface, usually quite an elaborate design. Engraving is done with hand. It's like what you get on a revolver, for example, where you've got, you know, squiggly floral lines. And that's done with a little, what's essentially a chisel or a pointy object. It's scratched into the surface. That's disappointing, because I thought <clears> what you were telling him is that some of the scabbards wearing were engraved, were etched. No, so, yeah, no, I've, I've, for I've, I've personally never seen an etched scabbard. But anyway, so to cut a long story short, scabbards are usually easy to clean. So what are we going to use to clean it? Well, number one, we remember to bring the WD-40 in this Whoa. time. Okay, so we're not going to waste the expensive ballistol. And apparently... Ballistol. No, apparently, <laughs> so a viewer, I'm sorry I can't remember your name, a German viewer said, oh, Matt, you are correct. Oh, it is because called... he's on the internet and he said that he's German and that's how you say it. It must be true. Well, I, I'm taking I'm taking it as a win. Um, so it's Ballistol. Matt not... Easton trusts his viewers. Yep, I trust the Germans, and it is Ballistol, not Ballistol. <laughs> ballistol sounds like a medical condition. Ballistol right? sounds so, so much cooler. So I'm going to continue to say it. Anyway, anyway this is WD40. WD40. So what we're going to do that is we're going to use that and. Da, da, da. Yes! We're going to use our, as I understand my Australian viewers call it, or is it Canadian? No, Canadian viewers call it a green scrubby. It's a we're brillo pad. A green scrubby. No, that's Australian. Scouring pad. <laughs> uh, a, a, how does a Canadian talk? I don't really know. I can't do, I, I I can't mean, do accents. It's really stuff, important that you don't go down this road. No. So I there's can, like a scouring pad. I can do, I can do an um, Australian. A, a green scrubby, all right, mate? He really can't, I'm Fair sorry. Fair income. Anyway, uh, right, WD40 so, scouring pad. So scouring pad. So this, importantly, is not the metal kind. It's the sort of plasticky, synthetic kind. So it is abrasive, uh, and we're okay with that because it's a scabbard, not a blade or anything else. Um, and it's abrasive, but it's not metal, so it's less abrasive than the metal ones are. And it doesn't put metal um, spiky bits on the floor or in our fingers or anything else. Okay, so Bonus. we've actually got two of these. Lucy's got one, and I've got one. Demonstration. We like that's just how we roll, really. I've also got um, this brass brush to hand. I don't know if we'll need that. Uh, but anyway, I thought I might have it out because if, well, I thought we might look at hilts and I'm not sure that we will in this video. Um, but anyway, let's look at the green. So first thing, first things first. So you get your WD-40, give it a good old shake and spray a section. Okay. Now I will demonstrate and then I will hand it over to Lucy. Um, because she likes doing it. And you basically just start doing this scouring in circles and, now, and we apologize for the really horrible noise that it makes that's I quite not like going that, to be so on your video well, i'm thinking it's probably not a popular noise now this is just a personal thing this is not something i've ever been told or taught but after rubbing just for a little bit on an area, I want to see what kind of effect that has had um, before I then go on and rub for ages on other parts. So I'm gonna rub with a cloth and you'll notice the brown gunk that is the rust comes immediately off. And we can see quite quickly what a little bit of rubbing has done. And it basically is brilliant. <laughs> this sword is like a dream sword to demonstrate on. So, um, again, I don't know if you can now see, so if we go down here, that is the rusty surface, and that's active rust, you can see, because it's kind of powdery, it'll come off like dust on your hands, so that's active rust sitting on the surface, so relatively light rust. 
Uh, whereas down here, where I've just been rubbing, you can actually already see bare metal. Originally, this scabbard would have been bright, uh, I won't say polished, but it would have been bright um, sort of satin finish um, iron or steel. Um, right, so do you want to carry on giving that a rub, Liz? Let's just spray some more up here. So if you just do that section for now. Sorry, I, like, I really like spraying with the LED4 thing. Just totally stamp that on my finger. Right. So as much as possible trying to rub in circles for the same reason as when we were using Autosol on the blade because we are always, when you're using any kind of abrasive... Oh, those really nasty marks. It's not a nice colour, it has to be said. <laughs> I won't say what that colour reminds me of. Is it poo? It's particularly a young child's poo, <laughs> yeah. Um, but anyway, um, a child that drinks lots of milk. Yeah, it's not a nice colour. So this, a, a white background probably wasn't the wisest idea, but it was the first thing that came to hand. Um, yeah, so, so because you're abrading the surface, you uh, it's better to move in circles simply because you will to some degree disguise the fact that you have been scratching away at the surface and the reason we've chosen these green scrubbies um, I don't know why I want to say an Aussie accent uh, but the reason we've chosen these green scrubbies as mentioned is because they're less abrasive than the metal versions um, I understand that in some parts of America the, uh, the, the Brillo pad is specifically the metal type um, I, we were in a supermarket earlier and I thought, right, I'm going to go and see what they officially call them in the supermarket. And the metal ones we call scouring pads. And these green ones just seem to be called, I don't know, I can't remember what they're called now. Um, but anyway, I think they're called Brillo pads mostly here. Running out of oil. So, but anyway, it doesn't really matter what they're called. Um, it, uh, the Scotch Bright pads, I understand, come in different colours, and the different colours correspond to their abrasiveness. Um, and you, if you search for Scotch Bright pads, you can find a key which tells you which colour to get for which degree of abrasion. Now, I understand that the green ones, like this, are somewhere in the middle, and there are finer ones, um, so more gentle ones, but there are more brutal ones. This is so interesting. Well, I personally would say, and this is, this is useful information, I think, um, I would say don't use anything more harsh than these green ones uh, for most things you're doing. Unless something's really, really heavy and deep set rust, where you might want something metallic, uh, if you stick to these sort of plasticky ones, I think you're going to do the least harm. Um, that's looking good, Luce. How does this feel for you? A lot like someone who's got a sore forearm. Are you getting tired? Right. No. Shall I have a go? No, I'm doing it. Um, Unless you want to do it. So I do actually. Yeah. There so circular, go. circular movements. Um, and let's just rub off, always just rub off the excess stuff so you can see how it's going. Yeah, it's pretty good. So it's interesting, this surface doesn't seem to be particularly pitted. So my guess is that this hasn't been rusty for particularly long. Um, and you know what, I'm not that, as you can probably tell, I'm not that precious about scabbards and, you know, I, I'm not going to attempt even to return this to entirely bare metal. Um, and a shiny surface or anything like that. I just want it to be clean and not rusty anymore. So what I'm aiming to do is bring it to its the surface that's immediately under the rust, which is a kind of darkish brown colour with a little bit of the metal surface showing, as we can see there. Um, but mostly it's about removing and stabilising the active rust. A little uh, comment as well about the oil. So I tend to use WD-40 because it's easy, easily available and fairly cheap and comes in a nice easy spray can. Different types of oils work in different ways. Um, the particular quality of WD-40 is that it drives out moisture. Um, in actual fact, we're not using that quality at all in this process. We're purely using it as a lubricant, really, um, and uh, as something to loosen up the rust. But if you put WD-40 on things that are exposed to the elements, 
that it's very good, especially things that are like mechanical, it's very good at getting the moisture to sort of come out of the um, sort of nooks and crannies of whatever you're using on. So hopefully you can see now, I've got a nice smooth dark surface there, as opposed to this uh, kind of powdery, come on focus, uh, as opposed to this powdery brown surface up here. So you can see powdery brown up to there, and then nice smooth brown. I'm basically just going for a smooth brown surface on the, on the whole of the um, scabbard. Now it should be mentioned as well, some scabbards were not um, bright and were not polished, even satin polished. Some scabbards were actually browned like some uh, gum barrels would be. Um, so, and the reason for that is to make them a bit more resistant to the weather um, and makes them a little bit more resistant to rusting. So in actual fact, returning it to a brown surface is, um, you know, whilst that may not be what this scabbard originally had, this was probably a polished scabbard, um, leaving a brown surface still kind of looks like how a lot of them would have looked originally. They would have had that, um, that kind of gun brown barrel look. I'll just do this bit loose and then I'll pass it back over to you, is that alright? Hand your arm. Yeah, it's getting tired, um, but it's all good exercise. The other thing, I, I, I have to say actually, cleaning, um, cleaning swords or any weapons like it's this... It's the sword muscles. It's actually, yeah, it's actually pretty good exercise. It is that, it's that one. It's, you know, forearms you and shoulders and fingers. probably can't see what I'm holding on my arm, <laughs> but yeah. So it's good to know, thanks for all the feedback on the previous video. Again, apologies that the uh, pixelation happened. That's a result of having towels on the table. Um, hopefully that won't happen with this, um, and this will be free of that problem. If um, it does, there'll be an exciting new surface for the next one. There'll be other complaints about something Astro else that's gone on. Um, no, AstroTurf <laughs> would be really bad. I would imagine that'd be exactly a like joke. a towel. Yeah. So, um, that bit came off better yeah, than that bit. Yeah, well, I think we Maybe rubbed it, it for longer. Right, do you want to have a go on the other side? I'm going to assume there was so, um, Helps if you spray the WD-40 onto the blade and not just around it. That's my tip. Um, this side's more rusty. Yeah, you often find that... Uh, with any sort of ferrous object, antique object that's got rusty, it'll often be more rusty on one side than the other. That can be for various reasons, sometimes because it was leaning against a wall and one side got condensation on it and the other side didn't. Um, or uh, one, side got, one side got rained on if it was left on a table or something like that. Uh, and the other side didn't. Can you Shall push I... on that end? Because yeah, because the other surface down. is uneven. It's kind of really Obviously down. this is normally a one person job, but um, I know that you guys um, get bored with my voice because let's face it, I spend a lot of time talking to you on, on camera. Your so. voice is never boring. Um, and I know that you prefer to hear other people on my channel like Dr. Capwell and uh, Lucy Easton and Augusto and other people who appear on my channel. Um, but no, I was going to say before, thank you very much for the positive feedback on the previous video. Um, I enjoy doing these restoration videos because frankly, I've got to do this, well I don't have to do, but I, I, I'm going to do and enjoy doing this cleaning stuff and restoration stuff anyway. Um, so making a video at the same time kind of makes it a bit more interesting for me and hopefully it's useful for you as well. Wow, that side's come up really well. That's funny, it, it's almost like there was more friction because the rust was more lumpy and it made it easier for it to come off. Rust is a very weird thing and I'm sure there's some people in the world who just study rust. Um, but yeah, you oh. can't you can't always guess how well rust is going to come off or what's going to be under the rust, whether it'll be pitted or whether it'll be dark or whether it'll just come off and be really clean underneath. It's really, really weird and I don't really know. I think a lot of it depends on if there was anything on the surface of the object before it got rusty. And I think sometimes if the surface was sort of oily but then it got rusty anyway, um, then sometimes the rust can maybe lift off more easily, I don't know. Um, it's all just speculation, really. It is speculation. I'm not a chemist. So an interesting thing about cleaning um, 
swords is that you discover how they're made actually sometimes when you're when you're cleaning them and restoring them so in the case of these scabbards they're made out of a flat sheet that's um, rolled around and you can actually see up here you won't be able to see on the camera unfortunately but where my little fingernail is coming along there's a line of brass and that's where the two edges of the sheet are folded around like this and then brazed can you see that Liz? brass yeah there there we I go. did not know that. Well, there you go. I'm even <gasps> even teaching. I learned something. Yeah. So so there. So it's a flat sheet that's folded around. You can around. actually see it. Yeah, and the edges are essentially glued together, brazed together with with brass. Um, and what they do is they cross hatch the surface, and then you kind of use molten or on the edge of molten. Um, brass to kind of fuse those two edges together it's a bit like welding but it's obviously welding, with them yeah. different with well it's not welding so welding's where you're essentially melting the, the the bits of the same material together whereas in this case it's glued with a different material um bit welded to bit welded to other bits. and you can see look if you look down here lucy just stops for a second what? if i bring this up here so this shoe around here which is called the drag okay you'll notice it's longer on one side than the other that's because this is the downward side so if the scabbard's hanging uh, and dragging along the ground it's more likely to hit on this side so it's longer on that side so you can tell that's the downward side and this is a, a sheet that looks like almost like a horseshoe shape that's cut around the end of the scabbard and it's put on and can you see the brass around there lucy so that is also yeah. brazed on as well. So that element is bra brazed onto the end. Um, and so I may as well talk about metal scabbards very briefly while Lucy's um, buffing on my weapon. Um, and um, I'm just gonna hold the end, Lucy. Okay, can so I grease it up a bit for you? You, you lube it up and I'll, I'll hold, hold on to the end. Um, uh, yeah, so metal scabbards, why? So a lot of people go, why did they make metal scabbards? They're, they're heavy, they're loud, they blunt the edge of the sword. Yep, all of these things are true. Um, but I think the main point is that European militaries in the 19th century were concentrated on making products which would last for many years. Um, it's explicitly described in British sources from the 19th century that whilst Indian scabbards made of wood and leather were absolutely fantastic for keeping the edge sharp, apparently on campaign they fell apart all the time. And not only did they fall apart all the time and, you know, just getting bashed and rained on and all this kind of stuff, they just disintegrated regularly. As well as that, um, they, uh, because they were susceptible, more susceptible to the weather, you could get problems of the blade rusting in the scabbard and this kind of stuff as well. So there were all sorts of reasons why metal scabbards were more durable and stronger, and so therefore they kind of pre preferred them. Um, because you've got to think about it from a logistics point of view if you're supplying an entire army. Uh, however, um, certainly in Britain and I think some other countries got around the issue of the bluntening uh, or, or blunting, I never really know what the right word is. Um, blunting, I think. Blunting uh, aspect of metal scabbards by putting wooden liners or in some cases leather liners inside the metal scabbard so, so that the, the blade is actually going into wood or into leather. Um, uh, but only the outside of the scabbard is therefore metal. So, you know, that's one way of getting around it. So I think we've uh, I think we're going to call it a night on this scabbard. Hopefully you can see from the reflection in the light. Try not to poke Lucy in the face with the end of my um, scabbard. Um, you can see it's now got a more or less shiny surface, which is a kind of dark colour, and that's patina, which means oxidisation essentially. Um, and you can see it's no longer matte coloured, or matte sheen, should we say, and, uh, and brown. It's now a mixture of kind of dark brown colour from oxidisation and a bit of silvery showing through the colour of the iron scabbard itself. So it's now essentially a clean uh, scabbard, more or less down to the metal with the patina. And it looks good, doesn't it? It just looks like an antique scabbard now. It doesn't look rusty. There's no active rust remaining. We haven't buffed it up to 
you know, being all silvery coloured. Yes, you technically could, but... But why bother? Well, why bother? And I think it would look wrong with the, the sword. You know, it is an old scabbard and it does have oxidisation. It does have patina on it. And I think that looks right. That's the right level to stop at. And I think going further would be destructive. Yes, you could absolutely get some wet and dry sandpaper and literally make the thing look almost like new, but I don't think that would look right. So we're going to resheath my weapon. I do have very oily and grubby hands now, as is Lucy. So there is the uh, sword back in its um, scabbard for now. And uh, for the next video, we're going to look at cleaning the uh, rest of the hilt. Um, so the back strap and the pommel, the guard, and also we're going to look at how we just bring up the wires on the grip. Um, to look a little bit nicer as well. Okay, so there we go. Uh, good night folks And I uh, hope you're enjoying this little series of basic antique sword cleaning and restoration. So goodbye from Matt. Bye and Bye from Lucy. Bye folks. Bye Thank you for watching. Please subscribe and feel free to follow us on Facebook